What's up guys, Larry Chan here. Welcome to another episode of Hooning and Autofocus. My friends at Yokohama Tire and Kerubu Suspension invited us out to Japan to cover Japanese car culture. Today, we're featuring this really, really, really epic time attack car that we've all played in video games. It is the legendary C230R. We got my buddy Masaya. Uh, you work at HKS? Yes. How long have you worked with HKS? I've been with HKS since 2007, so it's now 13 years. Uh, I actually work in the office uh, in England, uh, and I oversee uh, the distribution for Europe and Africa. Thank you so much for having us. This is really like a boyhood dream to come here. It's just so awesome to see these historic cars that I've only seen videos and pictures of and to actually see them in the flesh. What's the history behind this? Okay, so this car has undergone quite a few different forms. So as you see it today, it's this, I think it's, this, it's safe to say it's his final form. Uh, but the car started off under the concept of TRB02, the Tsukuba Record Breaker 2. So those of you who remember the carbon fiber Evo uh, from back in the day, it had an Evo 8 front end uh, on it. That's actually this same car. It crashed at Tsukuba when we were trying to set the record back then. And then it was rebuilt, has the new now Evo 9 front end uh, on the car. And then the color changed from black to red. Uh, and that's probably the form that everybody remembers it in most. That's when we underwent the name change. It changed from TRB02 uh, to CT230R. CT from the model code for the Evo 789, CT9A230, because this is actually a 2.3 litre stroker. Uh, and this uh, car we built specifically to try and break the, the Tsukuba time attack lap record uh, and in 2009 maybe 10 it's a little while ago now we actually set a record at the time 53.5 seconds uh, and i believe that record stayed unbroken for maybe five or six years uh, so it really was uh, ahead of its time the specification as i say it's a 4g63 engine packing the hks 3240 turbo wow this carbon work all of this stuff is done in-house here? Uh, yes, uh, we do have some facilities uh, to make some, some carbon. I'm not sure if all of it was done in-house. Most of it was. Everything within the main monocoque itself uh, is actually still uh, standard. So it's not a completely carbon fiber, but all the body panels, everything away from the, the, the core of the chassis uh, is all made in carbon fiber. And that kind of keeps it as a time attack car. That's why, I mean, this is a representation of what the car was like when it came off the factory. Yeah, so it's not well, a dedicated race car. It's not like a you know, tube frame chassis or anything like that. We tried to almost define the difference between the, the ultimate tuning car versus a racing car being two slightly different things. I think the lines are more blurred these days, but at the time we tried to keep uh, as much of uh, that feeling. This has very limited to no aero at all. Yes, and, and it wasn't really the, the thing to do at the time. It was all about producing you know, the maximum effects from mechanical grip. Aero was a bit of an afterthought at the time, bearing in mind this car hasn't run in anger for like 10 years almost now. It's crazy to think it's been that long. Like I remember hearing the news that this broke the record and even watching it on the recaps from I think best motoring or yeah, maybe yeah. An yeah. option, something like uh, that, yeah. option uh, those outlets. Like you said, mechanical grip, all wheel drive, and technology kind of pushing forward to make these cars faster. And manufacturers like us could really excel. We could really show the pure results of the products that we were producing. We, you know, we're really not essentially an aerodynamics company. We're very much about chassis dynamics, engine performance, uh, and this car at the time epitomized everything that we could do to make uh, the cars faster. Most of the parts, the, the main parts that make up this car were available commercially to sell. Obviously, you know, some of the chassis stuff was a little bit special, but the engine in its specification, the turbo kit that was on it, this used the, uh, uh, the GT3240 turbo at the time, running a little over 600 horsepower. So it wasn't huge power at the time either. It was very much about extracting the most from the corner speed. The specification, the dampers was a little bit bespoke, but the main shell of what we were selling was very much similar to the commercial product that we, uh, that we had 
code, we just adjusted it to suit the track, this car, because it's a lot lighter than your average Evo. And the kind of grip that we were generating was, was somewhat different. When it was the fastest, was it actually running this uh, uh, by fuel system? No, at the time it wasn't. So we tried to move to a new concept that, and um, compressed natural gas fuels was something that our founder, uh, Hiroyuki Hasegawa, was very strongly looking into. He was convinced that there's gonna be this revolution uh, in terms of how energy was going to be used. As part of that, compressed natural gas was something that he took a great interest in. Um, as a result, we've done a number of projects involving taxis and trucks and other things like that. Uh, this car, after it was retired from competitive uh, motorsport, was then converted to run with uh, natural gas. A concept to show that even a performance car could be done. It wasn't just an economical, ecological thing. We could still extract uh, good performance from that. Uh, so we did the conversion to allow it to run uh, by fuel. And I think right now in its current spec, it runs purely on uh, compressed natural gas on CNG. And how much uh, power do you think it is versus when it was running on it's fuel? It's a little bit down, but uh, I, um, I believe it makes in excess of uh, 500 horsepower still. This is interesting. Oh, wow. Okay. So you could see, yeah. So now it's a full on just natural gas tank and you just feel it right there. Yeah. Uh, it, um, I don't know if you've ever taken a taxi in Japan, a lot of the taxis in Japan run on uh, a gas system and you're used to seeing uh, like a tank in, in the trunk. So um, I think for some people who first see guys, Hold on, this doesn't seem quite right. A lot of people don't understand that HKS is not just a tuning company, it's a just industry in general in the automotive realm. Yeah, we're trying to, uh, we're trying to expand our horizons as much as possible. You know, the core of what we started with has always been in racing and performance. By understanding what the automotive field is doing as a whole, then we can make sure that it's reflected in all the aspects uh, we do. So without, uh, whilst we try to specialize in certain areas, we have to keep abreast of, uh, uh, of everything that's going on. And so this combined a couple of the projects that we never thought would really meet to, uh, in terms of our CNG development uh, and also our, you know, uh, our motorsports activities. So uh, this, is, this really did epitomize what HKS was about a few years ago when, uh, when we did this conversion. Look, you could still see the red here. It makes me wonder, do you think this will ever return to uh, its original livery or when it was most famous? Potentially, there's a possibility that it could be done maybe on like an anniversary type uh, thing. Uh, there's no immediate plans for it right now. It's interesting because most people, you know, remember it for what it was. And in fact, once the color changes, some people didn't recognize it. Uh, so um, bringing it back to what it once was uh, could could bring back some nice nostalgic memories for us all. Wow, the interior, it, it's sparse. Keeping it light was essential for us, and that was one of the major things, which is why everything's been replaced. But then little subtle things like, of course, if you only want it light, the dashboard could have been next to nothing, but you can see how we've tried to keep the form of the original dash for the most part, even though it's been remade. The effort very much was to try to maintain as much of the identity of the original car as possible, whilst extracting maximum performance. You guys have always worked with uh, Taniguchi, in terms of like um, this kind of time attack effort. Yes. So um, it really helped to have such an amazing driver to extract all the time out of this. Yeah, if you have a look at how the seat is bolted, it, this isn't sliding as right. you can see. Yeah. You, so if you don't you have the weight. leg length of Taniguchi, because if you've ever met him, he's yeah. quite a tall guy. He's very uh, tall. And so if you don't, yeah, if you don't have the same length of legs as he does or arms, then uh, you're not going to fit in this car too well. It's very much made around him. The time attack cars have transformed so much. I mean, I don't think this would pass any kind of technical safety, honestly, <laughs> just because, and that's kind of the, the thing about racing, right? Like you look at the old 935s and they basically don't have a cage at all. <laughs> yeah, it's know? pretty scary. Yeah, it's pretty scary. In Japan, the rules were never as uh, strict as they were in other parts of the world until more recently where they've tried to adopt like the FIA standard and things more and more so. So uh, this car, as you mentioned, the, uh, it, it's quite reflective of the time that generally they weren't that uh, stringent in terms of safety regs at the time. 
if you were to take this car out now with the current tire technology, it could be a lot faster. Yeah, I think so. I mean, at the time we set the record, we were running on the Yokohama Advan uh, AO48 tire, which was you know, the tire to have at the time. And now that we um, uh, have evolved a couple of models, I think, since then, the time that can be found that we've seen from, you know, most people who as they switch the, the tires, it really could have that, that potential to, to go even faster by extracting the advanced tire technology with you know, a little bit more of the, the aerodynamics that are being used in, in modern cars. You know, this, this car really could be you know, a good second or two, maybe five. It's scary to think that a car that was built you know, over 10 years ago could potentially uh, be at that pace. Well, thank you so much for showing us this car. We still have a lot of other cars to feature. You guys have such an incredible collection and that's kind of one of the cool things about HKS. You guys are really into um, keeping your heritage, you know, and, and uh, kind of showing the younger generation car culture and kind of keeping this sort of tuning and this sort of racing alive. I love that so much. That's a wrap.